Check, check. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Where are you, David Lee Scales? Same place as always. I'm at home. Nice. But you know what I'm doing? What? Unleashing the power of within. That is amazing. How is that happening? Via, I'm doing a Tony Robbins three or four day seminar right now. I had to get off of Zoom with Tony to be on Zoom with you. Uh, what was Tony saying on Zoom? It's wild. Unleashing the power of within with Tony Roberts live seminar via Zoom, four day extensive, in immersive, intensive. How many people are doing this thing with you or is it just you and Tony? <laughs> I think that would be a little bit expensive. That's reserved for Beyonce and Jay-Z. Perfect. Uh, um, thousands and thousands of people are doing it. They don't give you the number. Uh, and why are you doing this, David Lee Scales? Is this <laughs> self-betterment? So um, it's wildly expensive, first of all. So I would never, even if I wanted to do it, I wouldn't pay to do it. A friend of ours, a family member of Lauren's actually um, paid for it and was not able to you had some conflict, some work conflict or whatever, and you're allowed to send the ticket to one, transfer the ticket one time. So she transferred it to me and uh, it was kind of late notice. And it's like, I've got work scheduled, podcast scheduled, but I'll try to do it via Zoom, like throughout the course of the day, basically, because it's something that people, like I said, it's expensive and people get something out of it. You know, like Oprah Winfrey went to it at some point in her life. How many days are you in? Four days. It's yesterday through Sunday. Uh, okay. So you started yesterday. Do you yeah. feel more powerful? I mean, dude, to be perfectly honest, it's very easy to make fun of. And I think that you would get out of it what you put into it. Yes. So because I have it open as an additional window on my computer and I'm also working at the same time, I'm probably not getting as much out of it as Oprah Winfrey did. Uh, another quick question here. Uh, what was I going to say? I should have the power of now. Is it the power of now or what is it? The power of now maybe is Eckhart Tolle. It sure is. That is our friend this, Griffin Colapinto's mentor, <laughs> Eckhart Tolle. This is um, Unleashing the Power Within is okay. the name of his live events, I think. Okay. Okay. So uh, a couple questions here. I have heard tell that you are not supposed to uh, pay for rehab for somebody because then you know, they have to actually pay for it in order to get, you know, they're just not going to take it seriously or, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Or yeah. so are you having not paid for this? Are you going to rehab on somebody else's dime? A hundred percent. Yeah. If I paid the, per, I think it's like $1,500 is probably what the number is for yep. the online version. Um, if I paid 1500 bucks, 100%, I would have canceled all of my appointments and sat in front of the computer and taken notes. Yep, exactly. But as is, you're like, oh. I'll give it an ear. I'll give it an ear. And so just to give you an example of how cheesy it is, and I, I say it's easy to make fun of, I'll send you a video. I've screened, uh, recorded some of it to send to Lauren because it is th that funny. Every 15 minutes or so, he makes you stand up and like dance. And okay. dance like no one is watching. Like absolutely let, like speak through your body, every emotion that you're feeling, you know? Like and it. I think, I don't think it's all, just for the heck of it. I mean, I think it is by design. Like if you get your body fully incorporated into the process, then it probably has some additional lasting benefit or something like that. But this is how cheesy it is, is he's giving all these business examples to motivate people. And one of them was yesterday was about Subaru and Subaru was on the verge of bankruptcy at some point. And the example, the lesson was about understanding your demographic and Lesbians. really- Yes, exactly. So they hired a consultant and the consultant goes, you sell more cars to lesbians than any other car manufacturer. You need to market to lesbians. So they did a commercial with lesbians in it and it was groundbreaking. Like nobody had ever done that before. So it made, you know, world news completely changed their business. They're now incredibly profitable. And now they sell cars to people beyond, you know, <laughs> yeah, people who aren't lesbians. And so- he goes, you know, aren't you inspired to hear that? And people start clapping. No, let me hear it from everybody. Clap like you mean it. And so as people start clapping, they start playing Cindy Lauper's Girls Just Want to Have Fun. Oh. And then they go with three that. minutes of 
girls, girls they want to have fun and camera cuts to everybody camera cuts to all the zoom feeds of people in their house singing and dancing to girls want to have fun and i'm just like it's hard to fully invest when it's this over the top cheesy but i think if you were in the auditorium the you, the energy you, would overtake you you really? know you think you'd be up dancing to girls just want to have fun in order to celebrate subaru's groundbreaking pivot to the lesbian market and or I feel Subaru has done a really good job of now people, the Subaru customer is both lesbians and men who look like lesbians. So <laughs> you, they have the lesbian, uh, yeah, lesbian core is who Subaru gets. So I, I've got that poker group that's been getting together for like 12 to 15 years. It's really a wine group, but we call it a poker group. Um, there's six of us in it. Three of the dudes drive Subarus. Are they uh, like wear baggier than necessary denim? They do. They fit the <laughs> stereotype of what you're talking about. And we play into it and make fun of them constantly. But they're like, it's the Don't best care. car they've ever owned. You know, I, I mean? mean, that's what I hear tell. It's funny. I uh, a couple adjacent tangents here. Uh, one, first, I knew or I guess I still know her, uh, a girl who is Tony Robbins masseuse. And so she gets like, uh, I, I will ask her before, do you get like real, the inside drops of wisdom from Tony Robbins? And I think she does. In fact, I think she gets like, yeah, extra bonus power or whatever he's giving out. So there's that. And then, is, there, is that an innuendo? Uh, no, I think he's, I, I th from all I can tell from my conversation with her, this was a while ago, but, uh, was, yeah, he was a nice guy. He's doesn't he have giantism or something? Yeah. Yeah. And so I think his body hurts, uh, a lot. So I think he's on the regular massage train, but yeah, it seemed sh like there was no, uh, what, who was the basketball player? Or, sorry, Watson. There was no Cleveland Browns quarterback who got those massages quote in quotes oh. and would make women feel uncomfortable with his massages. None right. of that. No improprieties. Well, uh, <clears throat> yeah. But He's also, in So I also knew a woman who worked for Subaru, like on their race side. And I brought up, oh, lesbians. And she glared at me so hard where I thought, okay, this is one of those probably at this point, a dad joke that has gone on way too far is lesbians drive Subarus, like where it was funny, but it's not funny anymore. And it well, probably is not. Even when Tony was using that example, I, I started to cringe like, ooh, this yeah. may be like off color a little bit. But then he leaned in with the girls just want to have fun. Yeah. I was like, this is beyond a dad joke. This is like, it almost was funny, but then it was cringy. And now it's just like, you are we, completely cheesy. Like, yeah. like a 12 year old making a joke that I just can't even, you know, you can't make fun of and you can't laugh at. It's just crazy how, I don't know. I like that. A 12 year old, a 12 year old making a joke is a great analogy for lots of things uh, where, <laughs> where it's not funny, but you also can't make fun of the kid because he's 12. The 12 you just have to laugh. Yeah. 12 year olds have some of the worst senses of humor, I will say, in terms of like generally across the board is because babies or kids or toddlers or young kids are funny in spite of themselves. Like they do funny stuff. Yeah. Uh, and then, but when you have like, sort of in that 12, 13, where your jokes just aren't funny. They're not landing with the adult crowd. Though young daughter did really make me laugh yesterday. She described somebody as a barely straight Lil Nas X, which really had me <laughs> laughing. I'm not even sure I understood the words that came out of your mouth. A, you know Lil Nas X, the no. very, very, oh, he's a very gay presenting uh, musician. Rapper? Rapper ish, right? So uh, little, little L I L L I L Nas X. Yeah, I Nos. can't believe you've not you're unawares of. Yeah, you got to that. Austin's got to grow <clears throat> up quicker I, to get I you back. I feel like maybe I've culture. seen that. Maybe I've seen that name in text. Is it's N A S dash X? Right. It's N A just N A S space X space. X, uh, okay. But he's he is the creator and singer of along with Billy Ray Cyrus, I suppose, suppose of the mega hit Old Town Road going to take my oh, horse yeah. to the old town. So okay. a little Nas X. Yeah. Very flamboyant, though, but a barely straight little Nas X really made me laugh. But I suppose you'd have to know a little Nas X for it to be funny. I I mean, I get it now. That's <laughs> saying barely saying barely straight is already funny. 
So is Little Nas X flamboyant and gay or is yes. he okay. flamboyant and wildly gay? I think in one of his music videos, uh, he goes down to hell and either the devil gives him a Satan gives him a lap dance or he gives <laughs> Satan a lap dance or s- something like that. That's hilarious. I want to listen yeah. to his music now. He got he got real busted for that one. But uh, yeah, by Christians or like, I think, but yeah, by like devil worshipers who are against that. I mean, I, th- I think it was like, oh, Lil Nas X has gone too far. I think for the, yeah, Christians and Christian adjacent, like moral, yeah, Huntington Beach did not like that video. My dad, when I was young, told me that one of his friends growing up when they were kids had this mission, like a just kind of a uh, rule that he lived by, that if he ever died and went to hell, he was going to try to kill the devil. Sweet. And he was just like, why, why wouldn't you like you're yeah. already in hell like what could possibly go wrong you know you're not like, gonna go to hell or no exactly so yeah. my mission is i don't want to go to hell i'm gonna live a good life but if i happen to go to hell Don't i will then dedicate myself yeah wow it's like a commando i know i like it yeah. i think we should all abide by that yes all right well hey uh it is the grit it is <laughs> march 22nd 2024 And you know who is going to grace us with their presence today? Austin. Mm, We can do that. We can make that happen. But uh, one DJ Seaweed. Yes. He has submitted a new track for our usage. I was just reading about turtles. Hey, Kelly, you're so fine. You're so fine. You blow my mind. Hey, Kelly. Hey, Kelly. Hey Kelly, you're so fine, you're so fine, you blow my mind. Hey Kelly. Hey Kelly. Hey Kelly, you're so fine, you're so fine, you blow my mind. Hey Kelly. really good he is an artist in his prime that dj seaweed it is ridiculous ridiculous oh, speaking kelly speaking slater. of kelly slater speaking of uh, i've been sitting on this david lee scales sitting on my hands i know Weeks like, i've known this i feel like people wouldn't give you they need to give you the credit that you deserve for they this do. one they do they need to give me the credit for sitting on my hands for knowing that Kelly Slater's longtime girlfriend, Kalani Miller, was in fact pregnant. And I think we've discussed before, how do you feel about the we're pregnant, David Lee Scales? I'm for it. Really? I am <laughs> anti we're pregnant. Kelly's not pregnant. Kalani is pregnant uh, with Kelly Slater's child. Expecting, and I knew this weeks ago, but yeah. sat on my hands to let them to deliver the news in the way they wanted to deliver it. A black and white Instagram carousel montage set to Ben Harper's The Three of Us. They did such a poor job announcing, I felt, so bland, so predictable, so who cares, like, no whatever, that I decided to take it into my own hands to destroy their gender reveal. (laughs) They're having a girl, David Lee Scales. I saw that. Okay, so they did not announce that news? Nope. Yet. Okay. So just to fully break this down. Chaz, as he said, had this story. He's in the he's in the business of breaking surf news, and That's this it. is huge news story. Chaz mentioned to me weeks ago, and I thought about bringing it up last week. In fact, or at, at least teasing it. We like, should have. 
like something to the effect is like Kelly came up in conversation and I was almost going to tease like, oh, well, he's got some other plans on his 2024 agenda yep. or something like that. And I dodged it because I figured, you know, Chaz has been wrong before and I don't want to say whatever turned out to be true. So credit where credit's due. You did not step on their reveal. However, you are now making the story about you and then additionally revealing the sex of the child. I mean, they really like, let's be honest here. Let's be honest. Let's be honest about the birth announcement thing, right? Uh, I guess it's kind of a no win game, really. I mean, you're going to announce it if you're a celebrity at some point or or yeah. if you're a known, you know, sure, or else other people will or whatever. But I mean, the hands on belly thing, the Ben Harper, the three of us, the, uh, you know, the whole thing. I was like, come on, Kelly Slater. Like, if you're going to go down and make it straight up uh, a cliche, just don't announce it. Just announce it to your friends like normal people do. Uh, and then, you know, the Internet can get on board at some point and people can discover. Dude, this was not Kelly's making. This was not Kelly's like design. This is he, he was there in the pictures. Of course you and he I, was. That's what you, you do I, when your wife or partner gets pregnant and wants to reveal it on Instagram. You go with the flow. You do whatever she wants to do. We have talked regularly about where going to the flow with the wife's wishes leads you, and it leads you into matching pajamas on Christmas morning and never having sex with your wife again. <laughs> that was a vast leap from one <laughs> to the next. That's where it goes, though, man. It was an you Olympic know leap. The hands on the belly. Those Kelly Slater chewed up fingernails. Anytime I see a close-up of Kelly's hands, I think, man, that guy has got some nervous energy to get rid of. His nails are chewed to the nub. The you nub. Are really, you are really hyper obsessed with Kelly. That is one detail <laughs> I never would have known. Nobody would notice. Um, so look, Kelly's 52. Um He's been with Kalani over a decade, I'm sure, right? Yeah, I don't common know law, know. common law up. I wonder if right. Kelly and Kalani move enough because I think the common law mm. uh, it varies by change. state. Yeah. I think it varies by state, and so I wonder if Kelly has been person or uh, on purpose, purposely moving Kalani around so <laughs> as not to actually be stuck anywhere with the common law. Well, I don't know about the details there, but what I will say is congratulations to the couple because. I think this signals, I mean, beyond what it means for Kelly's career, like, is he retiring now or whatever? This signals Kelly committing to something uh, in a way that I think is really healthy and beneficial for him for a next phase in his life. Like, look, they've been together for a long time. And I feel like maybe we had discussed at some point Kalani, rumor got out, gossip got out that Kalani did want to have a kid. Like, that was in her cards for the future. And so, for Kelly to actually agree to it feels like a commitment to her and the relationship and probably to this unit of a family. And I think that that's a healthy transition for the next phase phase of his life. I think it's a good move. Great. I mean, perfect. And what do you think about uh, on the subject of advanced paternal age? Kelly joining a like gilded list, I suppose, a gilded line of older men having children, including Robert De Niro, who just had a baby at 80, I think. I think Al Pacino's right there having a baby at 82. Uh, Kelly Slater at 52. So yeah, what do you feel or how do you feel or do you have feelings about yeah. being an old man dad? I do. I think Kelly at 52 is the equivalent of a normal human being at age 37, basically. Okay. And so he will be alive for a long time and be a you know big part of that kid's life for decades and decades and decades, um, as opposed to those other two examples that you gave who are just, the other thing is those other two examples you gave, I think have a brood, you know, they have yeah, multiple yeah, kids by multiple women. And this yes. is just one in a long list that they're not going to be a part of their life. So what does it matter at age 82? Yep. Um, so yeah. So I think this is a much more kind of intentional, thoughtful move and, uh, I'm for it. I'm okay with it. Yeah, great. And uh, also now, like important questions. Will Kelly Slater push daughter? It's a daughter, ladies and gents. It's a girl in case you didn't in, in case you didn't read Beach Grit and get the gender reveal spoil earlier. 
I'll spoil it for you now. It's a girl. Will Kelly Slater follow the Josh Kerr route and try to make his daughter a surfing prodigy like Sierra Kerr? Or will Kelly Slater recognize that, hey, man, that's lightning in a bottle with this one right here. So I better introduce her to the flute or introduce <laughs> her to equestrian something or do something, have her fall in love with something else. So what I'm more interested in is whether or not the DNA takes over. So I don't envision that he would force her, force surfing upon her, but I would be interested if she just had this innate ability in the waves. And she's obviously spending tons of time at the beach because her dad's Kelly Slater. So then, you know, she just gravitates towards the ocean and has an innate ability that is unstoppable. Uh, what if you walked in to the next room tomorrow morning after you were got done with your Tony Robbins seminar and you saw Austin in front of a computer, headphones on, pretending to podcast, going... <laughs> talking stuff would you say oh uh, let's take that away and and give him something else or would you say yes i see you boy um funnily he is very talkative <laughs> and his mom likes to point out that he gets that from me so i don't think that would be a far stretch but that is you... one of my that is one of my favorite jokes. So when any ever anybody's like, "That's weird. How did you get into podcasting?" And I'm like, "Oh, I come from a long line. My grandpappy <laughs> was a podcaster. You know, I mean, he started on YouTube, but he really got his his groove in podcasting." Oh, very uh, funny. Uh, yeah, I mean, will podcasting even be around in five years? You know what I mean? Like, who knows? Hard to say. Hard to say. Squarespace is the all-in-one website platform that is designed for entrepreneurs to stand out and succeed online. Whether you're just starting out or managing a growing brand, Squarespace makes it easy to create a beautiful website, engage with your audience, and sell anything from products to content to subscriptions. They have flexible templates with designs for every category, templates that are simple to drag and drop your artwork or logos into, but flexible enough to redesign to your specs. They have online store templates that make it easy to sell physical merchandise, digital or service products like podcast subscriptions and paywalled content. They even make customizable merch. You can design products and they will handle the production, inventory, and the shipping and handling. So let Squarespace handle it for you. They'll save you time, they'll save you money, and will save you money by going to squarespace.com slash surf. You get a free trial and you get 10% off your first purchase. Squarespace.com slash surf, enjoy. Well, hey, we've got um, some dissenting feedback coming in about last week's show. I can't believe it. I know. It's shocking, right? Yeah. Um, we were talking about, or that guy uh, wrote that long email about, am I still a surfer? Yes. We both agreed. Yes, he is still a he surfer. He is. All right. DLS slash Chaz, TR in the DR here. Loving the shows. Couple questions. Or sorry, a couple comments. Question. If one loves watching baseball, but they do not play anymore, are they still a baseball player? If one who wants painted pictures in nature, but doesn't anymore, are they still a painter? In my opinion, there are surfers or one of the following, ex-surfers, astute observers, and surf critics. For example, I love baseball, but to call myself anything other than an ex-player would be delusional like ex-surfers. For example, if one injures their hand and cannot ever paint again, they are an ex-painter, regardless of their nostalgia, almost religious connection with nature, etc. Merriam-Webster states the suffix er is a, a person oc occupationally connected with, or b, one who does or performs a specified action, or c, one that is all present tense. There are no mentions of was in there. Contrary to the commentary, it is not a given that sunset is more interesting than trestles or that snowboarding backcountry is better than half pipe or park snowboarding. I, for one, am much more interested in the gymnastic aspect, as you called it, of these sports. Perhaps it is my background of being a lifelong two-sport athlete, skateboarding and surfing, which brings me to this point, or which brings me to my point in all of this. 
where does surfing get this crazy double standard where quote fans are more intrigued by what is relatable to them? Is it a personality type that is attracted to our strange endeavor? Whether it's considered, whether it's considering themselves a surfer when they do not surf or calling bullshit on airs over going straight through a barrel in what other sport art discipline are fans judging said act on how relatable it is basketball, golf, Olympics, martial arts, singers, dancers, artists, fans want to see otherworldly performances. I, for one, want to see uh, that in surfing, snowboarding, and skateboarding. Furthermore, it is my opinion that the wave is not the star. Neither is the court, golf course, mat, canvas, etc. Although interesting, it is the athlete and their unrelatable performance that is the most intriguing and inspiring work. Wow, I like it. I like the dissent, but I respectfully disagree on both fronts in here. Uh, I think, yes, if somebody quits surfing altogether, because this was not the case of our dear friend up in, where was he? Washington? He was in Canada, but I forget where in Canada. Canada. Yeah, yeah. So our dear friend was not giving up surfing altogether. He was just, uh, what? It was not going to be the like daily slog or the weekly slog or whatever out to cold water. It was going to be some reimagined way to do surfing. Now, if he would have said, just doesn't work for me anymore, I am hanging up the board, then yes, you were a surfer, right? When you actually stop surfing, Uh, But I do think that unlike baseball or basketball or whatever, nobody ever calls themselves a baseball player or basketball player. You're delusional to call yourself that unless you're a professional, right? Right. Uh, Right. So that is a different definition entirely. You would still say, I could still say, for example, I'm a runner. If I ran even, you know, one day a month, I could say, you know, it's really, I'm not really there anymore. I'm not really a runner, but I still run, which I think, a surfer properly would say if they're only surfing like one day a month would say, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I used to surf a lot. Now I surf one day a month. There would be, there's room in that activity to have like a shade of gray where you're still a surfer, but you know, you're not really a surfing that much. Right. So as long as you're still surfing, a B the, uh, relatable parts of it's, I don't think it's that it's the relatable parts. It is the best part of surfing. And that is phrased. I don't think the best part of surfing is going up and doing weirdo Superman airs or just like, I think the best part of snowboarding is not doing, you know, whatever rotation they're at now. And in, in the pipe, it's insane. You can't, the human eye can't see a four foot five Japanese kid, how many spins he's doing. Right. That's silly. I just was at a uh, natural selection. Of course, those turns that they're doing down those powder turns they're doing down the mountain Maybe you could think it's relatable. You could picture yourself doing it, but nobody could do a turn like those guys. And it is beautiful to watch. That's the essence of snowboarding. The essence of snowboarding is not spinning 18 million times off an icy half pipe. Same, the essence of surfing is not going up into the air and doing silly things. I love a functional air. I love even a flamboyant air from time to time. But the most beautiful part of surfing, what sets surfing apart is linking, I think, a perfect bottom turn timing that with a perfect top turn you know and then stalling getting slotted all of that like using the wave and then the last part where he's wrong uh the wave is the star in fact because unlike you gave the example of basketball court or golf course or whatever those things are static waves are always moving always changing dynamic so the wave and the surfer i think could have a co-starring role but the wave is certainly on the billing There's no way to do the thing without the wave and the certainly there's no way to play basketball without the court, but there is, there's all kinds of ways you can throw a hoop up anywhere. Right. And that becomes a court, you know, you still need that. But my point is the wave, there's degrees of betterness in a wave. And so the better the wave is, the better the surfing can be. And so you cannot do the surfing without the wave and the wave, whether, you know, you are going to, whether the wave is makeable or not is the thrilling part. And if finding a surfer could navigate through that thing, it wouldn't be thrilling unless the wave was presenting the canvas for it. So I would argue the wave is still the star, but let me go all the way back to the beginning here. Um, I agree with Tony. I think that I fully disagree with Tony on the first part, which I'll get into, but the second part about 
being relatable or not. I think we're both saying the same things. We're just approaching it from a different lens. Um, the whole part that we kind of ended at with our last episode was surfing is an identity. Baseball yes. isn't so much an identity. So baseball is a thing you do. Maybe, maybe some baseball players would argue with me that it is an identity, but I don't think that's as true as it is for surfing. I think and it's so, only an identity if you're a professional baseball player at the major league level and or minor, like if you're a lifelong minor leaguer who then gets into coaching or, you know, something yeah. baseball related after then baseball is your identity, but it's a small segment of baseball players. For sure. And even then, I don't think it's as much of an identity as surfers are. A part as surfing is part of as a surfer identifies as that being their identity. Like I gave that example last week of when I was 12 years old and going into the ocean and all of it being a metaphor for life for me, you know, yes. the lessons learned in the ocean have applicability everywhere else in my life from relationships to driving my car through traffic to all of it. And so that is kind of the point of what I why I was saying validating that guy as still being a surfer is once you have that infused in you and you see all of life through the lens of your surf experience, you know, you're a surfer and yeah, maybe you quit and your life perspective shifts and then you're no longer a surfer. But for that guy who wrote the email, he was still planning to surf. It's just less frequent than normal. And but figuring out how to do it better, right? Or figuring exactly, out how to maximize his exactly. stuff. Exactly. So I think that is where it's not relatable to baseball or to any other sport really that I can even think of. And so, um, but anyways, the second point of like, you know, whether it's relatable, whether seeing what the pros are doing is relatable to what we're doing. I think Tony talking about, he likes the gymnastic quality. It could be because it's just degrees more difficult than what Tony's doing as a skateboarder or a surfer. So there is still a relatability quality there. Like, yeah, he's never going to do a 540, but Tony relates that 540 to what he would do on a skateboard in a ramp. And so that's why he's aspiring or why he likes watching that style of surfing. And that's what cannot ever be lost with the Olympic snowboarding if it's in a half pipe. If it becomes so distant from what the viewer is doing when they are on the thing, then there is a disconnect and it just becomes less interesting to watch. For Tony, it's still relatable because he's doing a version of that thing. But for the vast audience, it isn't. And it becomes less interesting than the backcountry. Yeah. And I totally, you know, in things Tony brings up like gymnastics or in, you know, things that are already artificial, like nobody's out on the street. I mean, right. doing like the parkour guy is not like, oh man, I'm on the street, natural stuff, doing stuff. And this <laughs> Olympic stuff indoors with their, you know, pommel horses and their rings. That's like a lame version of what nobody does. You know, gymnastics, these sports were already built and baked in as obviously at some point, you know, gymnastics, I'm sure in ancient Greece or whatever was, yeah. <laughs> you know, based on physical activities that people were using in their day-to-day -day life. But over the 2000s years since the first Olympics, uh, gymnastics now is a weird, it's its own thing. It is a thing that you only do, you know, in that way. Whereas snowboarding is still has, yeah, exactly. has the everyman aspect and the, and so taking that and baking it and cooking it and distilling it to be half pipe snowboarding, which is totally fine. Nothing against half pipe snowboarding, but it's just, it really is an entirely separate thing yeah. from snowboarding. Like Sean White, for example, I've been out snowboarding with Sean White, uh, in regular snowboard life. Uh, and Sean is a, is a serviceable snowboard snowboarder on the mountain, but Sean White is nowhere near you know, the Travis Rice's or the Michael, ba Michael Bangs or the Jared Elston's or whatever, these big country, you know, or big mountain backcountry riders. Sean can't do that. Sean would be scared to do that. In fact, like that's not his thing. Right. And so yeah. taking nothing away from Sean, but Sean to me is like, okay, cool. You're this artificial thing. And then there's this real thing and yeah. you could like both. <clears throat> totally. Yeah. And Tony's point is still valid and there still will be guys doing 540s on waves you know what i mean yep um so love dissenting feedback though tr and the dr thank, thank you for you sending factormeals.com slash surf 50 let me tell you factor meals has filled a specific gap in our lives that has simplified our busy schedules and satisfied and nourished us 
If you follow me on social media, you know that I love to cook. My wife and I love food and wine, but there are still at least five meals a week where we're just underprepared, short on time, and don't want to make a bad dietary decision, nor sacrifice the pleasure that we get out of dining. Factor has solved it. Chef prepared meals that are delivered to your house weekly. They take two minutes to heat up and they're designed to be eaten anywhere. There's no prep, no cooking, and you can recycle the package that it comes in. Delicious meals that are good for you with over 35 options to choose from each week. Go to factormeals.com slash surf50. Less expensive than dining out, more delicious, more nutritious. Factormeals.com slash surf50. So we've got to we've got to address somebody's real conundrum here, and Veyer is going to help us do it. It's a tool to live by, David Lee Scales. It really is. We live with this tool. Uh, Veyer is spelled V A E R. These are American assembled, waterproof guaranteed watches that are honestly inexpensive for what they are. I mean, how long have we had our Veyer partnership, David Lee Scales? A while now. A couple years, I'd say. A Cu- couple years. This watch has not, not only has it not stopped, not only like this watch you don't think about, right? You buy it, you put it on, it does its job effortlessly. It's, it's great. And <clears throat> it, uh, you don't change the battery. This, no. Ours are solar powered. So there's automatic watches too, of course, that you put down for a couple of days and then you have to pick it up and then wind it again. It doesn't need a battery, but you still have to wind it if you don't wear it for a couple of days. This thing... Six hours of sunlight powers it for six months. Good it's to go. It's crazy town. So even if you leave it on your desk, the window's open, boom, it's getting light. Uh, okay, so go to veyerwatches.com if you would like to look stylish and be on time everywhere you go from this point forward, um, which is something that Tony Robbins would tell you to do. Yeah. All right, tools to live by. Hey, DLS, thanks again for the e- for the email that you read on the grit about my upcoming sail to surf adventure to the South Pacific. The guys at the Florida Surf Film Festival actually reached out to Allie and I and recorded a podcast with, we recorded a podcast with them for their uh, Surf Stories podcast. Should be out fairly soon. Anyways, I have a different topic that I would like yours and Chaz's advice on. Last night, I was hanging out with another sailor here in Mexico who's also preparing to cross to the South Pacific at the same time as us in two short weeks. He's 28, California firefighter, solar sailor, solo sailor, spear fisherman, avid swimmer, but notably he does not surf. I like the kid, but when he called himself a quote, water man, I couldn't help but call him out. To me, the term waterman is reserved for only the most elite and respected individuals of the sea that can do it all, capital letters. Surf, dive, sail, fish, SUP, kite, foil, body surf, swim, etc. I tend to also associate it with salt water, not fresh water. It's a term of ultimate respect and one that should be reserved for only the elite few, but that's surf culture. My first question for you and Chaz is what's your definition of waterman? Uh, being as specific and concise as possible, like a dictionary. My second question assumes that a waterman must be at least proficient at surfing. If someone from outside surf culture misappropriates the term and is adamant that surfing is not a requirement to be called a waterman, should we let it slide? Or do we as surfers have the duty to uphold the honor of and prestige of the title and set the record straight no matter what or how deb- heated the debate becomes thanks boys work p.s chaz never sent me the boat access restaurant in french polynesia i'm standing by dang it okay still on the way on the way thank you for reminding me and you're exactly right surfing the waterman is only salt water i will stake hard there you can't be a fresh waterman there's no such thing as a fresh waterman waterman is understanding of the ocean so that's what I would, for the most concise dictionary definition, I would say complete understanding of the ocean, which if you don't have an understanding of waves are a major part of the ocean, right? So you have to surf. I think the three major components of Waterman, and we can boil it down to three, you have to ride waves, you have to dive, and you have to sail. So it's on the surface of the ocean as it nears the shore, out at ocean sailing and then under the ocean. Those are the three components. I will say you don't necessarily like I would count 
Here would be the real could a <laughs> hardcore bodyboarder who dives and sails be a waterman? Yes, you don't. We don't need to do define the type of craft that you ride the waves with okay, because I right. would argue a incredibly proficient body surfer is the ultimate type waterman. of surfer. Yeah, or the ultimate surfer. Well, I mean, that, and that's the other thing too is like boiling down waterman to its purest elements of like you free dive, you know, without tanks, without anything, you body surf. And then of course sailing, but which is, has to be man-made, but you sail without navigation instruments and without any motor on board, right? Like would be the most pure form of waterman, I think. I think so taking what you said and boiling it down even further, I think it could be, the definition could be being able to completely exist within and on the sea yes. and rec i would have to work recreation into that because that's where the surfing comes in yeah but uh for sure uh though so, yeah i mean there has to be something i think about your yeah exist on the sea right or because recreation is part of everybody's life nobody's life is only you know grim i mean a lot of people's lives are that way but th like there's an idea in life where you at least have a little bit of fun i'm sure even the poor Chinese slave in factories building, uh, you know, Quicksilver hoodies, uh, has a moment of fun in each day, even if it's small, I mean, recreation it's, or enjoyment of life is part of even the bleakest of lives. So, and the, the reason why surfing is being forced into this criteria is because if you, if you call yourself a waterman and then you try to go play in the shore break and you get your ass kicked, you are not no, a waterman. Exactly. So you need to know how to navigate that and navigate the, you know, the vast expanse of the sea to get from point A to point B. And then you also need to be able to provide yourself meals, which requires going into the sea. So it's, it's an element of conquering and existing within. I'm glad that in the dictionary though, uh, there is the easy definition of just waterman, C colon Dirk Ziff. And then you can go to Dirk Ziff's entry in the dictionary and see Dirk Ziff, owner of professional surfing, circa blah, 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 who was dubbed co-water person of the year along with his wife in 2017 or whenever it was. You think they surf? No, I think the wife has been surfing probably like soft top push out for sure. She later done like surf vacation and I'm sure probably Dirk has once or twice like but the wife probably was an avid push me out on my soft topper. Yeah. Uh, whereas Dirk probably did it once or twice. Yeah. Well, to put a bow on this, absolutely Waterman has to be defined or has surfing has to be included in that definition. Now, what do you do when somebody calls themselves a Waterman to his point? Do you let it slide or do you call them out? No, you dismissively say, yeah, but you don't surf. Like yeah, you drop, yeah, yeah. you drop the like very like ultimate knife in heart dismissal, dismissal, because nobody yeah. can say, well, you, then you got to put them on their back heel and you can say, yeah, yeah, but I mean, you don't, you don't even do anything on the waves at all. And you, like, and you can end the argument without agreeing and they can think that they're right, but it needs to be stated that they don't surf. And they will know though, they can continue to say they're right. They will know that they are wrong. So this definition is not created based on 2024 standards of you and I hashing it out now. I'm taking everything that I said, and I think everything you said is based on Polynesian culture. Like yes. the first time I, anytime I've heard the word Waterman referenced, it was in reference to ancient Polynesian culture that subsisted off, you know, the ocean basically. Right? Yes. And, and recreational surfing was part of that as well. Exactly. Yeah. You and so I that, are, you and I are, yeah, light bears for Polynesia culture. Exactly. Uh, he went on just as a PS to say, uh, for a bit more context to my question, I hate coming across as a pretentious surfer, which is why, which if you don't understand the nuance of surf culture, it can be easy to do, even if we know we are right. Is it better to let things go sometimes and not be arrogant, even if correct, or should we stand by what we know to be true about our uh, passion to slide around on waves? So hard one, hard one there. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes some things can be let go. 
But when it comes to Waterman, that cannot be let go. Also, it's the douchiest move ever to call yourself a Waterman. If somebody even says that, yes, I'm you have waterman. to call them out. And you have to call them out and be like, but do you even surf? Yeah. But the fact that they even said it already defined that they're not a Waterman. Yeah. Sorry about it. Sorry, Sorry. about it, Fireman. You had everything else going for you. It seems yeah. like you are have all the Waterman potential in the world. But man, drop the ball. Maybe Dropped by the, the end of his show. maybe by the end of his solo sailing trip, he He'll can become surf, a waterman. Yeah, and quietly go about his business. I always in my mind, waterman is like always a, a very stoic man or or woman. Agreed. Like they let their actions do the speaking. Yeah. They're in the water all the time. So they don't yeah. have time to be yeah. discussing this with you. Yeah. As promised, we have two pros in the wild stories this week. Hey, David, I recently returned from my annual trip to Fiji with the Fiji Medical and Dental Foundation. A quick ad for our group. We are a group of dental and medical professionals that go to Fiji once a year to provide free dental and medical care to the Fijians, including but not limited to the staff at Namotu and Tavarua as a way of giving back to the region that provides us so much fun. This year, we treated over 600 patients and provided a variety of treatments from extractions to fillings. If anyone is interested in the work that we do and want to show us any support, please check out Fiji De FijiDentalMedical.org. FijiDentalMedical.org. Luckily, during these trips, we get to stay on Namotu and surf plenty when we are not hard at work. As the whole world knows by now, Fiji was absolutely pumping two weeks ago with cloud break reaching sizes that reduce mo most lifelong surfers to jaw-dropped channel spectators. The, after the next afternoon, I was surfing absolutely perfect restaurants when I saw a boat from cloud break drop off a group of stickered boards into the lineup at restaurants. I quickly caught a wave before the pros made it to the top, but paddling back out after, a after that wave, I watched in awe as a very recognizable Connor Coffin smashed the lip more times than I could count. Upon him kicking out, I heard him scream, oh my gosh, my leg, in what, I sounded, what sounded like true agony. He was only 10 feet away from me. As a borderline doctor, really just a dentist, I paddled over and asked if he was okay, assuming that he had a reef gash or some other injury. He smiled and said something along the lines of, yeah, it's a good pain. Just my legs are so sore from yesterday and earlier today. He then paddled back out and continued to surf uh, wave after wave with full determination, not holding back at all. What impressed me most was not his surfing, but his absolute dedication. To be honest, Connor has never struck me as a surfer who had put in a crazy amount of work, but by God, I was wrong. He had just surfed two full days of 20 foot plus cloud break, where from all accounts, they surfed for over six hours a day. And he had the dedication to come out and surf head high restaurants, despite the burning legs. He was also super kind, super nice, um, just as he seems. Anyways, keep up the work, Kevin. Great and truly, truly, Connor Coffin is a gift to mankind. He is, if anybody's ever run across Connor, I can't imagine anyone having, I'll, I'll even fish for one. If you got a negative Connor Coffin story, send it on in. I defy you. Yeah, he is kind. He's thoughtful. He is like, He's everything good, that Connor Coffin. He, yeah, they must have, because Parker is the same way. Totally. Uh, folks must have, or their folks must be great, great parents. They should write a guide to raising your children to be wonderful, and then they could gift it to Kelly Slater. Wonderful, talented, kind-hearted, well-spoken, intelligent, articulate, all like all of it. And by the way, I don't think it's a secret to say they were raised in affluent. Yeah, rich, an affluent rich family, kids. rich kids. So it's like that's hard to do to raise kids that way when they have access to everything. In, in Santa Barbara too, like uh, where, yeah, I mean, it's a they could they should be by all rights. Those two should be spoiled little brats. But yeah, they totally. are as genuine and wonderful a person or people you will ever run across. Still putting in the work too. So yep. I love this story from Kevin because when he says "smash the wave" more times than I can count, we've had that experience in the water, pro, on a wave. And there, you think three turns a wave is possible at this wherever you're surfing. You know, you're like, yeah, I could, 
three turns is kind of what everybody's doing out here. That's what, that's I what you maybe. can physically do. And then you watch somebody like that get up and going and they do eight turns that are bigger, more powerful, more precise, more everything than your best three turns that you could ever do on any game. It's like, it's crazy to see. I mean, the, 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 I always wonder about the firing synapses in that brain. Like when I get up on a wave, like best wave ever that I'll get up on, right? I'll paddle, pop up, look down the line, my mind and body can think about doing one turn somewhere way down there, right? Like I got a pump for a while, gets the flow. Okay. Feel the wave. Okay. Now I'm going to do a little, you know, like it's so silly, the slowness of both mind and body where those guys, yeah, a real pro bam, 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 bam. It's crazy. And, mm -hmm. and the, to his point about forget about the surfing, it's the dedication and determination. Also like my average session nowadays is 45 minutes to an hour. Yeah. So if I surf, if I go on a surf trip, I can kind of, I think I'm in shape enough to where like I, hours. What? You can like milk out two hours. Yeah. I'll get two hours in and then take a break and go maybe get two sessions of two hours, you know, and that's kind of like a full day. And uh, these guys doing six hour days in 20 foot surf where you're getting flogged constantly for sure. And then do it again. And then on your way in, you're like, oh, there's restaurants is good. Let's go put in another couple of hours of full intensity. It's gnarly. Yeah, it's crazy town. I don't, I mean, we've all, I think everyone listening to this podcast has been, or probably most have been into surf, like that really good surf shape you get where you just kind of don't get tired uh, when you're out, you know, but again, don't get tired in three foot California beach break where right. like, I don't know how these guys are doing it with heart and throat because yeah. And every account that I've read of that cloud break day, you know, you had adept watermen uh, and women talking about that day was terrifying. It was like, you know, it's not like, oh, this is, for you mere mortals, you know, you'd be scared by this. But for us, this is child's play. Uh, that was child's play for nobody. It was Billy Kemper, four time big wave world champ or something, right? Like yeah. he was pushed to his limits out there and still getting pitched over the falls. Yes. So, That's what kind of day it was. Yeah. Connor Crazy. Deer, Connor Coffin. Yeah. Amazing. You want another John Peck story? Sure do. All right. Peck in the wild. Hey, DLS and Chaz, been loving the pros and the wild stories. And I've got, and it's got me thinking of my own many different encounters over the years. Here's one with the reoccurring colorful character, John Peck. The year was 1970. Myself and two friends, Kirk Pearson and Andrew Spangler, were in the sleepy town of Kapa'a on Kauai's east side. We had pulled into an empty parking lot at the local IGA grocer to shop for supplies before heading north for our usual camping grounds. At the time, we were driving and living in a large army surplus quad cab truck with an extended bed that we shipped over from Oahu. The perfect accommodation for a small nomadic group of surfers in those days. It was early afternoon on a beautiful spring day. We stowed our purchased supplies in the back of the truck, hopped on the into the cab, and started up our home on the started up our home on wheels, ready to exit the parking lot and head north. Truck running, supplies and persons loaded. Then seemingly out of nowhere appeared a strange figure on the passenger side of the truck. He was tall, lanky, long shoulder length hair with a full but fitting beard. We recognized him quickly from our time on the North Shore of Oahu. Uh, we'd see him in and out of the surf, in Cammy's store, and of course in the surf mags. He was shirtless, wearing what appeared to be prison-issued leggings, presumably from the uh, Halawa, Halawa Correction Facility. He had a bedroll snugged under his left arm, a laminated and hot-coated board with an unfinished fin fitted under his right arm. Granted, we ourselves were probably running, were probably high, as hash was a daily ritual in those times, but the vibe was heavy. We were surprised, to say the least, baffled, and before any of us could conjure up a reaction, he made these cryptic statements. Help me finish my board, get me high, and take me to surf. The situation was so strange, and none of us in the truck were able to reply before instincts kicked in. Behind the wheel, I clutched 
uh, slid it into first gear and we drove off speechless, leaving him glaring into our window as we drove away. We had a good minute or si minute of silence in the cab of the truck before we all looked at each other and said, that was Peck. To this day, we have lingering questions about the event. Should we have given him a lift? How did he get there? Where did he go after we left? We never saw John Peck again on that trip, but heard he was in and out of trouble with the law. From our experience, though, he certainly lived up to his mystic reputation. Anyways, thanks for the great shows. Keep up the work. Aloha, Jeff Timponi. I don't know oh, if you know. Jeff Timponi. Yeah. A legendary surfboard shaper. Yeah. Very funny. And I love that they left. I was waiting for <laughs> And then we gave John Peck a ride and da 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 da. No, just like staring out the window at this dude. Get me high. Help me finish my board, whatever. Take me to surf. And just yeah. like, just driving <laughs> off is real good. I mean, look, it's a weird thing. If you look like you just got out of prison and you have a big beard and you're carrying, it's a weird thing to approach somebody. It's going to catch people off guard. And imagine if you're high and that encounter happens and you're just like, is this real life? Yeah. And like you recognize him too. You know, it's like this guy's out of the magazines. Is this real life or is this a dream that I'm having right now? I mean, I wonder though in... <clears throat> In surf world, right? Uh, this, it's funny that that kind of interaction where like, I'm trying to picture if I was there, of course, I don't know that I would necessarily give this guy a ride or whatever, but nine times out of 10, I'll trust a surfer somewhere out and about, which is so weird how much, you know, overcrowding and COVID learners and all this kind of stuff. And I guess that's not who I'm speaking of, but like somebody you really recognize like surfer recognizing surfer. I was like, oh yeah, you've really put your time in here. I mean, you trust that guy, don't you? You, know, you might not trust him with your money or your anything else, but you would like, okay, well, I have duty calls right now. I, I guess you have to take context into consideration here. 70s Kauai is the Wild yeah. West. Yes. And people are getting <laughs> robbed. Like you, you probably travel with cash. You know, their banks aren't a thing really, or there's not like a you know, banks on every corner, let's say. Yeah. So you want to have enough cash to buy gas and food and all that stuff. It's like traveling the road in the 1800s on a wagon yeah. where you have all of your belongings and you come across another wagon and you're just sussing them out. Like, are they going to rob me? Do they think I'm going to rob them? Can we help each other to get more things to get? And so these guys are just trying to get to their camping spot. And this guy shows up with a beard looking disheveled. Prison pants prison pants and you're like even if he isn't intentionally here to do something bad he looks crazy Trouble and he might have following. a shiv that he brought from jail and if we let him in the cab with us he may go stabby on us very true so lots of things to consider in the 70s in Kauai when you're on drugs <laughs> <laughs> and everybody else is too <laughs> But you got to love, we are slowly blueprinting John Peck's life on this one. It's, it's really true. I mean, I love how it went from Curran to now Peck. Peck dominates our pros in the wild. John Peck, Peck might have taken Peck over is, Curran. Peck is the prototype for Curran, by the way. Yeah, it's true. Curran yes. and all of his oddness. Curranism? Yeah, oddness does not come close or hold a candle to Peck. That's really true, which I, and I'm glad because I didn't know as much about John Peck as I do now. Well, I don't think any of us did. Exactly. Uh, but yeah, he's legend growing in just the right way. Um, I'm I've had this email about Curran for a while now that I have not read to you because I didn't know if it was appropriate or not. But now, for some reason, because it, we're having this conversation, it's I feel like it is. OK, then. I will give you this with a caveat and a grain of salt that this is not my words. This is an email coming through. Okay. Check. Check. It just said barrel or not on the subject line, but then <laughs> I open it up and it says Tom Curran's autism. Wait, hang on. That's offensive, but I need to grab your attention. I just listened to TC as a guest on the WSL broadcast day one in Panish, and It sounded something like RFK junior whispering sweet nothings. The guy is either mentally deficient or so bizarrely indifferent but if he's indifferent why do they keep running him out there uh uh well uh they ask him about specific female surfers and he stumbles on the most generic diatribe i've ever heard about basically nothing at this point i see tom curran content and i'm headed the other way 
the guy was a surf god, but just please stop putting him out in front of the camera. I mean, for sure. I hear I I could not necessarily. Yeah. Uh, like Tom Curran does a thing well, which is be weird and surf interesting, right? At this point, like Tom Curran, but Tom Curran should not be rolled out uh, ever. I don't think on camera, like he, he should be rolled out on camera in his own context, i.e. free scrubber or whatever but not in a booth, not in a Joe Turpel situation. People have, uh, I would love to interview him for Surf Splendor and people have actually like, you know, asked for it, but I, I've always been apprehensive to try to make it happen because I don't know that I can get an interesting interview out of him. Well, the, and the thing I think for you too, that we're not here and what you do through your work, there's some historical, you know, putting people in a historical context, some preserving their words for, you know, whatever, learning all that. There's a lot of reasons you do why you do and why it's good. Uh, rolling out somebody who clearly that's not the format for them. And then like speaking into a microphone is not, that does not make Tom Kern look good. So purposefully putting Tom Kern in a situation that where he's not going to look good and then preserving that for, okay, here we go. We're putting this on the shelf. This is you, Tom Curran. But Tom Curran is a man of action and a man, like he's a a phantasm kind of. He's some weird apparition you see and experience. He's not something, someone you listen to. Agreed. Yeah, the podcast medium is not the right medium to yes. fully appreciate Tom Curran, despite me wanting to actually engage with him. Uh, but let me ask you this. is Does he have anything diagnosed or is there any discussion about it? Like, is he just odd or is he, does he have some diagnosable um, personality quirk? Who knows? And, but also kind of who cares? I mean, I think dying, like are medically now saying, oh, weird people are on the spectrum. That's why they're weird, right? It's better just to say weird people are weird, I think. Like, let, let weird continue to be kind of weird. Keep weird, weird, man. Don't, don't put it in a you know, clean, scrubbed, uh, free medical. Scrubbed. Yeah. <laughs> a clean. Don't put it in a free scrubber. Uh, you know, in my medical book, I can now open up and, Oh, Tom Curran is, has this form of autism, right? I don't want to know that Tom Curran's just weird. And he's also smoked a shit ton of weed. So Tom Curran is a shit ton of weed smoking weird guy. And yeah. that is way better than, well, what the Tom Curran has, X and X, you yeah, know, yeah. form of bloody blah, blah. Like who cares? That doesn't help. I think it does. I think labels can actually be damaging for sure. And, and really limiting and understanding somebody's, the dynamics of their full being, but they also do help you relate to somebody more effectively. And I mean, if the thing could be treatable as well, so then you can medicate for it and stuff like that. But also it just helps you give you context when you are engaging with this person for how they best communicate and engage, you know? For sure. And I think for children or whatnot, right? Like, sure, yeah. like kids and, you know, knowing, okay, this person or this child learns this way differently or, and being opening up, you know, what are all of the avenues of, okay, people are different. Uh, but I think I just wonder, I suppose, and I would love for somebody with more experience with autism or whatever to weigh in, but you know how, like when you're like, okay, we're going to put you on the shelf labeled yeah. with this thing, right? Does that other than, yeah, hey, man, you're just, you are a different cat. I mean, even saying that he's weird is a label though. You know what I mean? It's just not a specific enough label. And the problem is if you say autism, then maybe that's too specific and that's why they refer to autism as a spectrum because it's an understanding of it's a multitude of different things, you know, yeah. but so I, I don't know, I guess I, there's just a wanting to know as a human being that I just, if somebody said, oh yeah, Tom Curran has a mild degree of autism or, or what, it, I don't even know what autism is to be perfectly honest. So maybe it's not that, maybe it's something else. But if they said Tom Curran had X, I would say, oh, everything makes sense now. Like everything snaps into focus for me because I wasn't sure how to define him. And I, to your point, I like the, well, we don't know everything. So it's yeah. just mystical. I like he's, that too, but a human part of me wants to know, you know? Wants to know what it is. What is it, Tom? To a certain degree. Um, well, moving on. Surf shops in the wild. Let's go here. Nice. How are you doing on time today? Uh, I got a probably 10, 20 out. 
So 15, so we got 15 more. 15 minutes. Okay, yeah. let's do pros or a surf shop in the wild. Hey, DLS and Chaz, I've been enjoying the surf shop stories lately and thought of a funny one myself, but also am going to suggest that you make it a somewhat recurring segment. I'm guessing most of your audience is old enough to have interacted with surf shops for most of their lives, and they are no doubt a huge part of our culture. Uh, there's going to be a lot of good stories. So here's one. This could be 2018, or this would be 2018. I know because it was after the Montecito debris flow. For weeks, the 101 was shut down, cutting off Santa Barbara from everything to the south. Not great for retail businesses. Channel Island Surfboards has a sale once a year where they sell blems and some team boards for some pretty good prices. They usually get picked over pretty quick, as you might imagine, but not this year. I was... Uh, so I scored a taco grinder for big days or travel if I ever go back to Fiji. Done with my selection, I head up to the front of the shop to drop down the credit card. And here's where my surf shop story really begins and why. Every surf shop is the same, at least in Southern California. There's an overly stoked Grom that is 16. He just got his driver's license and this is his first job. He's there to get discounts on boards and gear and to get noticed for what is about to be his exploding surf career. His proximity to industry gods will only prepare him for future greatness. And there's also a 20-year-old hot chick. She totally understands retail and is the only one that adult customers want to deal with. She runs the place. She can't wait to turn 21 and work at a bar or restaurant and make three times the amount of money. The Grom's second ambition in life just behind his desire to be on the tour is to get in that 20 year old's pants. This will never happen. She has no desire for the Grom whatsoever and barely tolerates him. As I walk out of the store, board under arm, I overhear the Grom say to the hot chick, that guy I just sold that board to, he surfs good, like really good. Really? She asks skeptically. Yeah, he replies, then pauses to reconsider not wanting to seem uncool to the hot chick. Yeah, I mean, he doesn't look like it if you look at him, but yeah, he surfs good. I still consider this my favorite compliment on my surfing that I have ever received. Backhanded skeptical approval from a shop grom trying to not ruin his chances. I still laugh thinking about this. Please withhold my name to protect the guilty. That is a phenomenal story. Thank you so much for sharing. The surf shop stories, like the amount of, again, we've talked about it. I've written about it. Like the amount of, interpersonal, cultural, like all the things at play in a surf shop. That's why they're going to be missed when they go the way of the Amazon is that all like none of that exists, obviously shopping online and, yeah. you know, like walking into a room, so judging yourself versus who else is in that room versus who's working in that room versus I even love judging a surf shop, like going in and saying, oh, this surf shop's not core. Like walking into a surf shop, you know, is kooky. Uh, cause they're selling kooky shit, whatever, you know, just trying to maintain, make any kind of money. Like I'm cooled in this surf shop, which yeah. having been out cooled by many surf shops in my life, walking into being cooled in the surf shop sometimes feels nice. How right is he though about the employees? Completely. Like every surf shop I ever went to had the hot chick that I was so intimidated by. Yep. I was just like looking at her like, Oh my God. Like, yeah. If she looks at me, I'm literally going to like pee my pants. I'm yeah. that nervous to interact with this hot chick right here. Um, and so true about how that hot chick is not like living the surf life. I mean, she may be ish, but yeah, is looking to get out of there. Like next, oh, yeah. next better opportunity. She's gone. Absolutely. hundred yeah. percent. I, I've probably told this story on the podcast or a podcast at some point, but um. I would save 30 bucks as fast as I could in high school and go buy a surf movie, a surf video, you know, and I'd find the video that I wanted would be surfer magazine had like a section where they would review videos, video reviews. And so I'd get that every month and I, there's three or four and I'd kind of like thought out which one, maybe I'd have 30 bucks a month that I could dedicate to it. So I would then go to the surf shop and the surf movie videos would be under the glass at the register. Yep. So I'd go up there and I'm looking and they have more than the magazine had, you know, there's 20 of them in there. And I'm like, Oh shoot, that one has Chris Ward on the cover. Like I kind of want that. I like Chris Ward. So I was at rip curl, the rip curl outlet in San Clemente. 
after surfing like uppers or something. And sure enough, there was that hot chick at the register and I am annoying the me taking my time trying to figure out what lingering and 30 bucks was a lot of money to me. And I really wanted to pick the right movie. You know, she was just tapping her nails on the glass, like could not be done with me quick enough. And I, there was a movie, it was called Annihilation and it was designed like a Wheaties cover. Like it looked like a Wheaties box and it had Annihilation written in the Wheaties font and in the oval where the athlete would be, it was actually Chris Ward standing like with his hands behind his back, no leash in a pit at off the wall. And I was like, I want annihilation. And I point to it and she looks at me all annoyed and she goes, you mean anhiliation oh. <laughs> and corrected me. <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah, I guess anhiliation. And I just put my head down and like <laughs> gave her my $30 and walked out with my tail between my legs, like fully, fully shamed by the hot chick that was five years older than me. And then a couple of years later, I thought about that experience and I was like, wait a second. It's pronounced annihilation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like my 16 year old self knew it, but was so embarrassed. I just gave way to her because she was five years older and hot. She was such a dumbass. She had no idea how to pronounce annihilation. I wonder how your life trajectory would have changed <laughs> if you would have said, uh, no, it's actually pronounced annihilation. If that moment right there, if that would have buckled her, you could have ended up with her hot night in San Clemente. Could have been a father at 17 to like, just think how it could have gone for you. I know. I'm, I mean, I wish... We had the technology to figure out where that girl yes. is today. What yep. is she up to? What does she do for a living? What does she look like? Pretty soon. We can probably plug that into an AI pretty soon and have the AI suss out what the possible, like what the most probable scenario would be from that. It would be very interesting. Yep. I wish her well, you know, yeah. I just I hope she figured out how to pronounce annihilation at this point. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, have you ever gone to a high school reunion? No. Have you? No. Yeah, I went to my 10 year reunion. Oh, wow. Sweet. It was like right when Facebook was like becoming omnipresent. I yeah. think I think it was I think Facebook became omnipresent right after. So like it was a bunch of people at that reunion that I hadn't actually seen, but then shortly after, we all became friends on Facebook and now I see them all the time. But that 10 year gap was like a shock Whoa. showing up to see who's who, what's what, what do they look like now? I can't, uh, yeah, I can't even imagine. I mean, my, when did I graduate? I graduated 94 from high school, which was that 30 years ago? That's 30 you years say ago. 94? Yeah. Yeah. 30 years ago. 30 years ago where, and I don't know any of my high school friends. I don't see them on Facebook or anything. So I'm sure I would have like a full on, yeah, aneurysm. It's an inter it's a very interesting exercise. Well, maybe I'll go to my 45th year. Yeah, you should. I mean, I I mean, probably like all high school boys or most high school boys, I obsessed about the hot chicks. Yeah. It just completely like idolized them in a way that like was just so not healthy to where if I ever actually interacted with them, there was no way that it would be a healthy or normal exchange because you just put them on a pedestal. You know what I mean? Did you see those hot chicks? I mean, that's the problem. I would think yeah. that at my high school reunion, at least up there in Coos Bay, Oregon, none of the people I actually would want to see would go to the high school reunion. But I imagine down here, you get a lot of wider net of people who just, oh, might as well go it's down the street. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, I don't know what I was expecting to get out of it or who I was, what I was expecting to see, you know, and, but the hot, the, the ultimate, I mean, the stereotypical reveal in every rom-com movie where this, they go to a high school reunion is they're all uh, not as attractive as they were when they were young. You know what I mean? Like one of a, one girl in particular who I really obsessed about just had like a massive leg tattoo, like a thigh tattoo, you know, like, Ju and just had not aged gracefully and it was just like what yeah was 18 year old david even thinking like I mean, you are so dumb when you're that young you have no ability to project what could be you know but that's i mean i feel that that 18 year old version of what you think is beautiful versus a matured one is the difference between like uh, a runway model and a 
print model, right? Like what you think is beautiful, then you realize, oh, that's like pretty for like accessible pretty. But there's a whole other level of yeah. like bizarre uh, that's actually like art beauty yeah. that ain't, for, you know, just the pretty girl. Way more interesting. You Far, by far and away more interesting. Yeah. Anyways, thanks for the surf. See what the surf shop stories do. I tell you, they open up. They open up the... Yeah, portal to the past is what they do. Yeah, by all means, listeners, surfsplendor at gmail.com. Send in your surf shops in the wild stories. Okay, well, let's go to commercial break, and then we've got Barrel or Nah to come back with. Rocketmoney.com slash surf. Just this week, my wife figured out she was paying a subscription for Showtime, but then also paying for Paramount Plus, which includes Showtime for free. That's precisely what Rocket Money was designed for a modern tool that meticulously tracks the details that we easily get distracted from. It's a finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your monthly spending, and helps you lower your bills. It gives you freedom by helping you see your subscriptions in a simple dashboard and alerts you about hidden fees or increases. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over $500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things that you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash surf. Calm the clutter in your head, simplify the tedium of your financial life, and find freedom through rocketmoney.com slash surf. Chaz, welcome back. Great. Extensive commercial break. We got so many great sponsors nowadays. It's wonderful. I love it. I love it. I love that our listeners can both benefit here and benefit during the commercial break. It's really great. It's a gift yep. that we're able to give. Yep. Uh, okay, barrel or nah. First one comes through from a listener. Let me share my screen with you. Okay, volume up. Hey guys, this is uh, Patrick from Boston calling in for the grit. Uh, I think I might have a barrel or not for you guys. Uh, a little bit of crossover here. I was listening to the boardroom podcast with Cyrus Sutton, <clears throat> and he recommended this really cool book that uh, sounded interesting. So I ended up downloading it on Audible, listening to it. It was all about uh, prehistory, anthropology, things like that. And it talked about this one phenomenon uh, with the Iroquois, how they believed that dreams needed to be fulfilled. Um, and if you saw something in a dream and you didn't do your best to try and fulfill what you saw, that uh, bad things would happen to you. But uh, anyway, so um, I was scrolling through surfboards online the other day, as I'm prone to do, and sure enough, I see a board that I saw in a dream uh, probably seven or eight years ago. I had a distinct dream of me looking at a picture of myself holding this board. Um, and now I don't know what to do. Should I buy it or not? Because I already have too many boards. kind of ridiculous. But anyway, um, yeah, I think I got a barrel in off of you guys uh, following your dreams or like dream analysis type stuff um and yeah whatever your answer is will probably be the decider for me whether i pull the trigger on this thing or not but anyway thanks uh keep work buy the surfboard or not it's this is such an important question because we are dictating here and of course you have to buy it 100 yeah. percent, you have to buy it if you had neither read that book uh and you would or yeah it didn't have that in the back of your mind when you called up and said, hey, I had a dream about a surfboard. Should I buy it? I would still say yes, to be honest. I would say, if you're calling and asking, the answer is yes. If you had a dream about this board, answer is yes. Doesn't matter. Whatever. Like, if this was, if he said, I had a dream about a house, uh, you know, and whatever, then I'd say, ooh, that's a tough, you still got to do it. But that's going to be, that's tough right there. Uh, that is tough. But a surfboard, it's maximum you're out, what? A grand. Yeah. Which is not, which is not nothing, of course. But you just, sorry, sorry about it. The universe has, is forcing you to pay a grand and going to open up something else for you that's going to be worth, I'm going to guess, far more than a grand. Well, 
it's not just I had a dream about a surfboard. It is that specific. It is a premonition. It yes. is a very specific image of him and that board. And so if you then encounter that board in a retail environment where you have the opportunity to fulfill the dream, you'd have to be insane to go the other way. Only problem is I'm fully barrel. You have to do it and you roll the dice, dice. But the only other problem here is, uh, have you watched the latest season of True Detective? Yeah. So there's voices that tell the people, for those who haven't watched it, voices that call people out onto the ice where the eye, this is come, come, oh. come. And then the ice breaks and there you go to your death. Uh, so this dream slash premonition, you might, and sorry about it if this happens, but you might get that board, paddle out on a big day and die. You could, you, this could be a final destination situation. Yep. And, but I would think trust Either your way. instinct on that. If you, in that premonition felt an eerie, you heard a violin in the background creaking or you felt some sort of a twinge of, you know, some negative feeling, don't do it. But it sounds to me like a pretty, I mean, if he's going by what the Iroquois said in that book, you have to fulfill you have the to, dream. No matter what, to. even yeah. if this is the way you're supposed to go out, so be it. I'm saying go for it. I mean, this is a Not really to. rare, weird thing. When he even got to that point in the call of like, I had a dream. I, I was like Saw laughing. That's such a weird thing to have happen. You have to follow through. Barrel. Um, speaking of things that have you watched Nicolas Cage's new film dream scenario? I haven't, I want to, it's on the list. Haven't yet. Is it great? It's, it's, I really expected it to be great. It's not great, but it's good and it's worth watching. Okay. They just added it on HBO. If you have HBO Max on the list. So dream scenario, uh, he is a pro college professor who everybody on the planet has dreams about him. So it starts off real small with just his daughter dreaming about him. That's normal. But then he goes into class and like a couple of students are like, I had a dream about you last night. It's all, all kind of a play on going viral. Like he goes viral, but it's because In the dream. world is having, it's really bizarre, but yeah. really good. Yeah. Okay. Bar barrel or non number two, chewing gum. In any context? Chewing gum. I'm a barrel on chewing gum. I feel, yeah. It's like, I'm not a big gum chewer myself, uh, but there's times in life where gum is like the perfect thing to do the way to waste time. It's just that, you know, whatever fidgety kind of thing. I'm a barrel on gum. And I, then, and then there's people who make it look great. Like from the gum smacking eighties, you know, whatever John Hughes film actress to baseball players to like gum has such a place in so many iconic uh, forms that I'm a barrel. I have zero need for gum in my life. Even when I was young, I think maybe it was just like a flavor thing is why I ever did it, but it's a child's thing. It's like, if gum went away now, I would not miss it. And I disagree with you about the gum smacking. When I see other people chewing gum, I'm like, you're a grown ass adult. Why are you chewing gum? Like, what is the purpose of gum? I hear you, but gum is iconic. And as things that are iconic, you stay gum. You I'm have my blessing, gum. gum. Done gum goes gum. away. Done okay. with gum. No gum. No barrel. <laughs> the final barrel and all came through as three different phone calls because the guy's line kept cutting out. So I can't, I was going to try to patch them all together. It is incoherent. I can't play his calls, but I want to do him justice because I've been in this scenario. Barrel and all, pushing past people on a people mover. Oh, a hundred percent barrel. 100% barrel. Uh, give, drop the shoulder a bit and give a shove when you need to also people assuming that either escalators or any form of people mover the flat one at the airport yeah the escalator is a replacement for walking yeah are idiot people idiot the escalator the moving thing people mover are not replacements for walking they are to get you there even faster than walking they're in addition Correct. to walking so if somebody chooses to take a break on those that is their prerogative you push far off to the right if anybody is standing in the middle bump time so last time we were in the airport lauren austin and i we get on the people mover and because we have the kid or whatever we uh park it on the people mover which is not my custom but it, in that scenario we were parking it i could see somebody with purpose coming up behind me and so I, and I'm pushed off to the right, as you stated, and I pushed Austin off to the right too, but Lauren was standing blocking the aisle. 
And there was somebody eight feet in front of us, group of people blocking the aisle and then a group in front of them blocking it. But the person behind me was coming up with purpose. And I whispered to Lauren, I'm like, hey, scoot over to the right. She goes, why? I'm like, that guy's coming up. She's like, yeah, but he's just going to get blocked by those people. I'm like, that's not a, that's for him to then push through. Like that's for them to figure out on their own. All I know is there's etiquette move over to the right, please. Because we need to abide by the etiquette. We're no, we are better than those people. Yes. We abide by the etiquette, no matter what they're doing. Yes. You know what I mean? Amen. So then, you know, after 45 seconds of her listening to me berate her about moving to the right, I think, uh, it was she all did. a wash at that point. Yeah. I don't even remember whether she took my advice or not, but point is move to the right. Everybody move to the right. If you get bumped, it serves you right. Yeah. And absolutely bump. It yes. needs to now start bumping. So that lessons because need to be taught. The parkers are taking over the bumpers at this point. Like yep. there's too many people who are parking. using that. Yeah. Parking it. And it's, it's just it's, like, it's not a replacement for walking. It's an addition to walking. It expedites walking yes. for all of us to get to where we're going to faster. Get out yep. of the way and also bump if you need to. Exactly. All right. Hey, great show, Chaz. Thank you very much. Beachgrit.com. And of course, at Surf Journalist. Anything else going on? That's all. All right. Thank you. Good, sir. And until next week. Keep work. All right. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you.